liked watching television and making believe I was on television. And I had, there were some times when I was a normal child. I was on the Howdy Doody show. That's a normal child would do. Yeah, there were other children in the peanut gallery. you buy the many fine products of General Foods. Hi, I'm Tom Cottle. This man is a man that creates extraordinary humor. The substance, the content, the timing is very different, I think, than what we're normally used to. In fact, as I was thinking about it, he sort of turns the world upside down from time to time and acts, asks us to kind of stand on our heads to even grasp what it is that he's doing. And we do, and we seem to love it. Now, who is this creator of all this comedic stuff? Who is this man, Andy Kaufman? Quite frankly, I don't know. But in a minute, when I come back, I'm going to do my best to find out. We are back, and I'm speaking today with Andy Kaufman. And it's a pleasure to meet you, Andy Kaufman. We're sitting here with two guys, two colds, huh? Yes. A cold uh -huh. with a balloon on the box. Yes. I, I know very little about you kind sir but I'd like to find out a little bit if I may okay and I I suppose as good a starting point as any if you'll forgive me is to try to learn a little bit about your childhood here's what I found out something about childhood that you locked yourself in the room I heard yeah I would lock myself in my room and uh, 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 put on television shows all day for and, yourself uh, well yeah I thought that there was really a camera in the wall and that uh, I was really on television and uh, my parents would always tell me go outside and play with the other kids yeah and I would say I don't want to you know and uh, this worried them but I, I, I really liked staying in my room and just putting on shows all day what but shows what shows would you put on I had about four hours of programming every day I, my, <laughs> I called my uh, station channel five because I learned lived in a house five the number on the house was five yeah. for the street address was five right. so I said it was channel five plus channel five in New York was a real station so I figured I was on channel five and uh, oh let's I had all kinds of different shows uh, um, adventure shows horror shows uh, old-time movies cartoons well, what, what would you do though well I would play all the parts I would I would just run around the room just playing all the parts and, uh, and you would announce the show. This is now. The there was a. There was a. Yeah. There was. Let's see. There was a. I know. I don't remember much of them. I remember one that was like an old time, uh, silent movie show. Because in those days on television they showed a lot of old time silent movies to right. on, ch on children's programming, you know, instead of cartoons. Sure. So I I didn't understand what was going on on these old time movies when I would watch them. So. Uh, so all I knew was that these people were walking around faster than usual, and that there was this music playing. So, and I didn't know anything about the plots of these movies. So when I was recreating them for myself, all I did, really there wasn't any plot, it was just me for a half hour walking around going, like this, you know, <laughs> you know, like that, and just doing all kinds of faces and then falling down and stuff like that. No one's in the room with you? No, no one was in the room with me. Would you perform in front of people? Would you do this in front of your parents or your no, brothers and sisters? No, but when I got older, my mother really began worrying, and she said, uh, I will not, you cannot do this anymore unless you have an audience. And even if it's one person, I don't care, you must have an audience. And my sister, my little sister had just been born, and she hardly knew how to, she didn't know how to talk. She didn't know anything. But, well, I don't I don't remember how much she knew how to talk, actually, because she could chew gum. She loved bubble gum. So what I would do is bribe her, and I'd give her a piece of bubble gum every day if she would just sit in the room. And also, I wasn't shy in front of her because she didn't know how to talk. So I would just put on these shows, and she'd sit in the room, and she'd be my audience. And that was my loophole. I, I got my mother on that one. You know, I had my audience. Was your mother worried that something Yeah, they were worried that I was crazy, you know. I was alone a lot of the time, you know, but lonely childhood. Because I, well, I read that, and I also read that your parents were concerned and took you to psychologists. Yes. To try to find out, I suppose, is this guy all right? Yeah, they were or is worried. he off the wall? Is he crazy? Is he something wrong? I would imagine. Yeah. Well, because I was always alone, and my mother told me, when I was two years old when my brother was born, <clears throat> he was my uh, younger brother. I, w I was the oldest of three. Yeah. And she said, a few years ago, she told me, I didn't remember this, she said the reason they started taking me to psychologists or psychiatrists was because uh, when he was born, I started standing in the living room and I would stare out the window 
just stare. And I would be very sad. And they felt that a child shouldn't be sad. So they thought something was wrong. Were you sad? Do you I remember guess I being? Was. No, yeah. but do you remember being sad? Yeah, I can remember. Yeah. Do you remember what you were sad about? Had anything uh, made no. you feel sad? An event? Uh... No, just sad. I, maybe it was my grandfather. One of my grandfathers died when I was very young, and I was very close to him. Pap Papu, I used to call him. Papu. Papu. And he used to sit with me in the living room at night and sing this one song that he taught me, which was our song that us two had together. It was uh, The Grandfather's Clock. Which you know, was Oh, uh, the grandfather's clock stood 90 years on the wall, but it stopped short never to go again when the old man died. Yeah. You know that song? Yeah. So he and I would sing it together all the time, and I was just a real infant, you know, but I remember it. He was a real gentle man. He was always gentle, never yelled. My mother told me about him, you know, as I got older, how he, you know, refreshing my memory and stuff, yeah. you know. Uh, he was just that way. He wasn't just that way with me, but with everybody. He was very gentle. So he loved me very, very much, and I loved him. And he died when I was about, I don't know, two or three years old. And, or... About the time you started looking out the window, perhaps. Maybe that was it. I don't remember if I was five years old or three years old or two years old. Yeah. My mother would remember. Yeah. But he died, and, and when he died, remember, he, I remember he, he was in the hospital for a while, and I would see him less and less, and I would think, oh, and I was getting sad, because he... Not seeing him. Not seeing him. And then, um, when he died, they didn't tell me, because I didn't know anything about death. So they told me that he went away. And I said, well, when's he coming back? And I kept waiting for him to come back, and he never did. And I, I was just asked every once in a while, when's, when's he coming back? When's he coming back? And uh, they said, well, he's never coming back. He went on a long trip, and he's never coming back. And when I got older, my mother said that they realized that it was a mistake for them to tell me that, because then I kept saying, well, why didn't he take me with him? If he was my friend, you know? And then I pictured... If they, he loved me, yeah. he would have taken me. And they said uh, that God, who I just thought was this other guy, you know, God took him away with him. God wanted him, so I said, well, what happened? So I pictured him driving along, that he had gone on a vacation, and uh, all of a sudden God lifted him up out of the car and, uh, you know, and wasn't bringing him back, letting him come back. Mm. So, so at first I think I resented the fact he didn't take me with him, but when they explained to me about God lifting him up... That's kind of a nice idea. Yeah, it was all right then. We're going to find out more after we take this break, okay? Okay. Back in a moment with Andy Cole. Wrestling stuff. Yes. You challenged women to wrestle you. You yes. had women in this country enraged at uh -huh. you. Come on, I challenge women. And if you lose the wrestling match, you got to go back to the kitchen and... Uh, and if they win, they would win $500 to $1,000. Win $500 to $1,000. Yeah. You had a lot of people furious with you. Yeah. Now, I want you to talk about that. Now, added to that, some guy from the NCAA wrestling world comes up and he says, you're giving wrestling a bad name. He was a, a real wrestler comes up and, yeah. and you challenge him. Yeah. And he, he practically killed you. Uh, yeah, but I never wrestled any man, a man except that once. That's the only time I ever did and that's the only time I ever will. And I thought it was going to be... See, I thought that wrestling up until that point, I thought that professional wrestling was... You know, sort of uh, fake. Fake. And uh, when I, after my, what happened to me, what happened was I challenged this man, and I thought, you know, these guys don't know how to wrestle for real. They just, they, they're not strong. They don't know. What, they, they never hurt each other. And um, I got in there joking around, and I that day because I saw how serious he was, and I started to realize it, but I couldn't back out. It was, you know, that was that night. So what I did was I was going to, if you ever see the tape of that match, you'll see that I run, I never, when I, I never seriously expected to wrestle the man. I, I ran from the man the whole time. I, there's a, a legality, a technicality, where if you keep your feet out of the ring, you have 10 seconds, then you get back at the ring, then you have 10 more, then you get out of the ring, you have 10 seconds. So I just figured I'd do that through the whole match. But I didn't realize it was going to be a 30 minute time limit. Well, finally, the man caught me, and he did what he did, and it, landed me in the hospital for three days and now I he totally he picked you up yeah and he threw me down on, on your head. head three times three times yeah and I, and and now I'm totally sold on the on uh, that wrestling is totally real I, I believe that now, it's totally what real in God's name prompted you to do this whole wrestling routine to begin with challenging well, women challenging this guy now what what are we the audience supposed to take of that? well okay I was mr. Kaufman sir okay I was always a fan of professional wrestling I always always loved it and watching it 
And um, just, I'll give you an analogy. I've always been a fan of Elvis Presley. Right, you do so, a great imitation. Thank you. I was, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was, when I do my Elvis Presley imitation, I'm not trying to, I've never tried to make fun of Elvis Presley. I've just been imitating him as close, as closely as I can. And it's because I admired him so much since I was a little kid. So what I'm doing, and that was something I would do in my room alone, imitate right. Elvis Presley. So I go on stage. When I play conga drums, I'm imitating Ola Tunji, the, the African drummer from, I think, Nigeria. Yes. I have all his records. I used to stay in my room and imitate him and make believe I was a famous African drummer. When I go on stage and play conga drums, I'm, I'm trying to recreate that as closely as I can. Well, in the same token, I used to idolize Buddy Rogers, uh, nature boy Buddy Rogers. The big, blonde guy. Yeah, he yeah. was the world's champion from around 1961 to 1963. Yeah. He was the greatest wrestler of all time, in my opinion. He, he invented the term, I am the greatest, uh, I got the brains. He no invented one said the I got the brains before Buddy Rogers. No, he was the one. He, yeah. he, he, whenever you see, I'm, I think that there are many wrestlers, and in all great respect to them, uh, a lot of them probably felt very, you know, admired Buddy Rogers. And to this day, there's a lot of wrestlers that, that you can see that they've been influenced by his style. Uh, he, had a, he, was a, he was to wrestling what Muhammad Ali was to boxing, what Elvis Presley was to rock and roll music, okay. in my opinion. So, you so when I did my wrestling thing, <laughs> I wanted to recreate. I saw Buddy Rogers wrestle once in person, and that was in 1963 when he lost his world title to Bruno San Martino at Madison Square Garden. I was in eighth grade. I remember the frenzy that he brought to the, audience, to the crowd. He was the most... Uh, how can I say, M magnetic, energetic, exciting uh, athlete that I've ever seen uh, participate in a sport. And he brought a crowd in any sporting event. I've never seen a crowd get that worked up oh, over, they do. over a man. They do. Now, I remember I was part of it. I was also worked up. The, he was uh, incredible. So what I wanted to do was recreate that in my act. So Which by means doing getting so, people to adore you and getting people to hate you. Well, no. in this case, Buddy Rogers was, he did, even though he was my favorite wrestler, I admit he did wrestle in a way that got people to hate him. Now, I, I guess that was done, it might have been done purposely so that people would come and see him and pay money to see him. That's one of the major points of professional wrestling. So anyway, in my attempt to recreate what I see, saw Buddy Rogers do throughout my childhood, I challenged, I wanted to somehow bring wrestling into my act. Now, if I challenged men, I would get beat very easily. You know, most men who would come up on stage would be bigger and stronger, and they might even hurt me. Women... As this guy did when he put you in the hospital. Yes, just days. like, yes. Yeah, so I was right. all those so years. So you pick on so I, you know, so I, I challenged the women, and I very legitimately offered the 500, which later became $1,000, and to get them upset, to get them, you know, a lot of times they wouldn't volunteer, so I would have to say, you know, I would have to say all these nasty things about women just to get them to come on stage and just to define for the audience that the audience should be booing me and we're rooting for the woman so I could get this, recreate this, this, That's the uh, Buddy Rogers this thing. Buddy Rogers atmosphere. And, um, um, that's what I was doing. Let me ask Andy, and I don't want to keep harping on the theme that you're weird or anything like this, I'm a, uh, but do, are you, are you going to pay some price, or have you felt that you're paying a price not being the typical company guy, the organization guy, the doing what everybody else does, the getting into the lifestyle that everybody else has? If I, if I was like that, I don't think I could do what I do. If I was just regular normal, I don't probably wouldn't be able to do the things that I do on, you know, when I'm perf performing. I mean, like, for instance, my Elvis Presley imitation is the result of being alone for a year, 19, I think it was 66 and 67, when he was at a low point. You know, he did go through a few years, several years of being considered a has-been by most of the country except for the South, Southeast. Because um, I remember I was in New York growing up, and I was the only one I knew that liked Elvis Presley at the time. That's when the Beatles were popular, and a whole new kind of music took over, until 1969 when he made his comeback. <coughs> so, 
I was the only one that liked him, and I would stay home most of the time and just play his records and imitate him. Adopted him as a character, combed my hair like him, dressed like him in, in school, you know, and all my friends would call me Elvis, and, you know, and I, but it was, it was not at a time when he was popular at all, at least where I, in the section of the country where I lived, hardly anyone liked him at all. And people would laugh at me and scoff at me if I said that I liked Elvis Presley. So because I had this taste that was different from other people, I was able to work on this unknowingly, not knowing that I was later going to become a, a performer. I was actually working on my Elvis Presley imitation like most of the day for one year. This has been intriguing and interesting and enlightening to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for joining Andy Kaufman and me.